Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a brand new series here on Carrot Corner Poker Education entitled Play and Rant. In this series, I'm going to be dropping my volume down to one table, usually of a game like 200 Zoom on stars, but it's going to depend on what's running. I'm going to talk through all of my decisions in play and explain format, but I'm also going to be ranting about a pre-designated topic. In today's introductory episode, I'm going to be ranting about how to have a theory first thought process in poker and why that's important. If you like the content, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and like the video and check out carrotcorner.com for all of our exciting paid content, including the mass data driven grade E of the Carrot Poker School dropping in just a couple of weeks time. Let's get to the video. So today's video is really about having the right protocol, having the right order to your thought process. If your thought process is a mess when you're doing hand review off the tables, it's going to be a mess at the tables as well. Having theory come first is really important. Not in the sense that we want to shun exploitative deviations and we want to become rigid robots that just copy theory at all times, but in the sense that if we have a baseline, if we're able to act in accordance with what we think is theoretically correct, and we're able to put the theoretical options on the table, for example, here I can say, I can call or I can 3-bet, I'm usually going to 3-bet, I'm now going to roll the RNG, or I can call or I can 3-bet, I'm usually going to 3-bet, but against the specific stack size, or with this guy in the big blind, I'm actually going to call. So there's a real order to things. We begin with the theoretical truth about what we should do, and we go from there, you are allowed to deviate from it. But when I say that the solver has done, or G2 has done a lot of the heavy lifting for you, what I really mean is that all of your equity, EV, implied odds, outs, your range against your opponent's range, at least what they should be, has already been calculated and computed for you. King, Queen, 10, I believe we can actually play a strategy with quite a lot of bet in it. I think this hand can bet really frequently. So what I'm doing there is I'm laying out the theoretical options. On the turn, again, I'm going to lay out the theoretical options here. I think I can probably... Can I block bet with this hand? Possibly. I'm not actually sure on this occasion. This might just be a pure check now. I think the equity's kind of, in a weird way, gone down a bit on the brick turn here. And then on the river, again, I'm going to lay out my theoretical options. I think I could make a very small block size here, or I could check in practice. I think it's way better to check. I think people are quite unlikely to pay off a bet here with sixes or something, but they may well just start bluffing too much in this spot, so I'm just going to check call here. The other option is check raise, that might be on the table in theory. I think in practice when villain has ace, queen or king x and stuff like that and I've played this way, check raise is going to underperform a little bit. So just going to go for check call there, but you get the idea. We're laying out the theoretical options and then we're choosing from them. If we can choose between them in an exploitative way, like on that river I decided that it was way more likely my opponent starts bluffing with ace x suited or an underpair than it is that they call a bet then I can decide to check instead of make a really small block bet. But really small block bet there is, is actually okay in theory. It's probably not that bad in practice, but we're going to stick with this protocol today. This is something I really need you guys to see, that if you look at poker solvers and think, I don't want to play that way, I don't want to copy a solver, that's not my MO, you're misunderstanding how poker theory can help you. It can help you by giving you a head start, giving you a shortcut. Like if you understand what the default play is and why, You've already done so much of that work that you would have to do. I, I hear students like dive into ranges and be like, well, against this hand, we can do this. He could have this. He could have that. And they dive right into their opponent's range before they've even laid out the theoretical options. And that's just so wrong. It's such a bad, disorderly, chaotic way of doing things because you're not going to be exhaustive. You're a human. You're never going to analyze your opponent's range completely correctly. I'm a fan of analyzing ranges and using them as a reason to deviate from the theory where all the work has been done for you. Hopefully I'm being really clear about this. So options here are to range bet or to split. That's the strategic options. I'm going to just choose to range bet, therefore I don't have a line option here. If I was going to split and use big bets, then I would have either check or bet with that hand. And I could do either. Or I could go to the exploitative realm and see if that can tell me what to do. But in that spot, I don't believe there's going to be a big deal. Options here with 10-3 against men, I think, are just to fold, even without the 3-bet. So I keep going back to this question time and time again. What are the viable lines in theory? Sometimes there's only one. Sometimes there's more than one. Sometimes you don't know. But when you're doing your hand review, if you don't know what the theoretical lines are, that's a great time to actually pause and go and try and figure it out. What are the theoretical options with queens here? I think 4-bet and call are both theoretical options, cutoff versus big blind. I'm going to do more 4-bet than call by quite some distance, but I think they're both completely okay. So if I'd rolled a particularly high number there, which signifies passivity, I would have just called. 
how could I have got that wrong? I know it's a really boring basic preflop spot, but this is all about protocol today. I don't really care what kind of hands come up. I don't care how exciting they are. Theoretical options for ace-deuce are just default. Do I have an exploit? This player's tagged blue, but they do have reggae stats. I'm not actually sure whether that's a weaker player or not. It may not be. Actually, they're opening a reggae size, so I'm going to say that that's, that's not a weaker player at all. This definitely is, though. And so with the queens, it just goes in that way. It's like, let me put my stuff on the table first, because if I'm not careful there and I just start rampaging into, like, idioms and ideas and stuff I've heard people say, and I'm like, it's too passive not to forbet, well, I've just got the spot wrong. So I didn't ask what was the case in theory. If I know it's theoretically fine to call there against big blinds polarized range with queens, I know that it is, then I don't have to worry whether I'm being too tight, too passive, too nitty. These are all expressions that just come from self-doubt and dread, and they come from a lack of objectivity. You need to be capable of conviction and confidence when you're applying what you've studied. So anyway, I am just one tabling here. This video is mainly me ranting. There might be some cool hands that come up. There might not. It doesn't really matter. I'm just showing you protocol. Theoretical options, only one I have to open 7-5. Done. If you always ask that question first, and you have a course like the Carrot Poker School that shows you what theoretical options actually are, I think this is probably a mix. Theoretical options are raise or fold. I'm going to roll, and in this case, I'm going to raise. So if you have a course like the Carrot Poker School, a theory course that can guide you as to what the theoretical default is and why, the why is really important because it helps you quickly come to that conclusion. The way humans learn is not actually through rote memorization. Some people go really wrong in poker because they try to rote memorize strategies and how to split their range and what sizes to use and it's just a load of shit and it has no bearing on reality. They don't even know why they're doing what they're doing. Theoretical options are only 3-bet here. I'm not going to do anything else with Ace Jack. I'm going to make it 6-big blinds. It's my only option. Spot done. It's more about meaning. So if you have a course like the Carrot Poker School that tells you why the theory is what it is, that's really going to help. Okay, theoretical options on Jack Jack 7. I only have one. It's going to be a big bet and it's going to be a big bet with range. That's the way I play this spot. I know that. Off we go to the races. All of the reasoning about why that's best theoretically, that's already in here. That's already been done for me. I don't need to care. Is this a pure bet on the turn? I think so. With Ace of Spades, maybe slightly less urgent, but I think this probably is a pure bet, so there's only one theoretical option. I'm going to be 60. We're a little bit deeper here, actually. Could I be 75? I'm going to stick with B60 here, although I think B75 is also okay. The deeper you are, the more you can size this turn bet up. But I think this is probably a pure bet, and therefore I'm not going to roll or anything. So you can see I'm putting my options on the table straight away. Bill and Raise is here. They can definitely have worse jacks. They can have 10-9. They can have pocket 8s. What are their bluffs looking like here? Ace-10, king-queen of spades maybe, things of this nature. I think I do a lot of jam on this node. Obviously I'm not folding ace-jack. We even have a lot of outs against straights. I think there's only one theoretical option here and it's probably to jam. I could be wrong about that. Unfortunate. Fortunate. But yeah, we're trying to put all the options on the table first, as we did there. Sometimes we might not be sure, and this is where the review part of this comes in the curiosity part of this, where we have a couple of questions that we want to ask the solver and we want the solver to answer those questions. All right, we are back after taking a quick break. The pool has filled up somewhat. I can see some short stacks about, which is always a good thing. This is one of them. We're going to just continue our, our flow here. Theoretical options are call or three bet, as this is a weaker player. I think isolating them, playing a pot with them takes precedence, so I'm not going to mix any call here, even though it's okay in theory. But nevertheless, we laid out the theoretical options. This video is going to be so repetitive, but I'm just trying to get this into your heads and make this become a part of your game. I think it's really going to help. Okay, theoretical options here are going to be either big bet or check on this texture. I don't really use any small bets in theory. Exploitatively though, what I might do is just size my big bet down slightly because I think this is a fairly inelastic spot. Like whether I bet 60% pot here or 40% pot, I don't think there's going to be a big difference. I could check, that's definitely still fine. I have a slight preference for c-betting against recreational players in this spot, which I'll talk about in a second, so that was a deviation not to roll there. I think this is pretty close to range bet. You can third pot or b60 here. I'm going to go ahead and just use this sizing. I think it's exploitatively going to be a bit better. I think hands like pocket pairs are still very likely to continue. I don't think there'll be enough elasticity there between the small bet and the big bet. Therefore, when I have a value hand, I think it just makes sense to use the big bet. The reason I decided not to roll check on the flop is the unknown recreationals can be a bit volatile with stabbing when checked to, just in general. And when you have a hand that could either see bet or check fold, I tend to shy away from check fold in cases like that where I would be squandering quite a bit of equity. But still, you can see the procedure. We put those options on the table and then we choose between them exploitatively. It's just such a good habit to get into. 
Okay, so you can go either way here. I'm going to go ahead and 3-bet based on my roll, but you can do either. So if you miss that step of saying what is on the table for me in the first place, it's so easy to get bogged down in what I call insufficient reasoning. So insufficient reasoning is where a poker student is going to make a choice based on a reason that does support that choice, but it's not the big picture. They're not zoomed out enough to see the true situation. Options here, you can 3-bet as a bluff at a low frequency or you can call. Options now, I don't think you squeeze now with this combo. I think we just peel here, especially with the recreational player flatting the small line. I think this is a recreational player. I think we just peel here. It's somewhat reluctant, but I think it's fine. Only one theoretical option, that's to check to the preflop aggressor. And then depending on the sizing we face here, that'll dictate which theoretical options we have going forward here. We could also face a check, of course, in which case we'll have to think about what to do there. I think only theoretical option is to raise. I don't think there's going to be any slow play with two pair here, but there might actually be with top two. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and raise. This is one I'm not 100% sure about. What I do know is that I'm going to be using pretty big sizing here because I'm going to be polarizing. So... If you imagine my range, like what's the bottom of the value region here? I don't really have ace-king. I don't even have a lot of king-queen and it's not clear that I want to raise it. So this could be a spot where we're really just raising pocket fours, king-10, pocket tens. Queen turn is good for my range, but not so good for my hand. My theoretical options here are to bet kind of big or block or check. And I think we can probably just roll this. I'm going to go for the kind of big bet on that roll. Check is something that had I rolled it, I might have actually decided not to do it. And that's because in spots like this, the pool is going to be guilty of just calling with a much wider array of hands than they actually jam with, than they actually bet with if we check. So again, we can say checking is probably okay with King-10. It's not a monstrous hand on that turn by any means. We do want to check that turn sometimes. We want to bet that turn sometimes. It's a decent card for our range. Some of our bluff raises hit straights on it. But it's not the case that we have to bet and therefore we're going to actually roll. However, now we come to the exploitative part of the decision, which is that I don't think people bluff enough on that note of check to, I think they're too passive. Now I'm just going to value bet and just try and get value from villains made hand range, pair plus draw range, etc. That is the secret to a logical, calm, collected thought process. It's to go from the theory to the practice. Don't RNG unless you've drawn a blank at the exploitative side of things. You'll see here that when I leave the theoretical side, when I put the options on the table and I move to the question of what should I do, I always check in with the exploitative realm first to see if I think there's a front runner play. That's to say, to see if I think one play is better than the other. Okay, king 10 3 here with ace-king. This is a situation where I think with ace of diamonds we have a mandatory c-bet. We're going to use big sizing here. I don't think this hand can check. So when there's one theoretical option, that's the one we're going to take. Okay, you could say there's a strategic option of small betting there. That's also true. I'm just not using that strategy. So for me, small bet's not on the table. It could be there's nothing wrong with it, but it just ain't on the table for me in that spot, which is fine. Okay, so this is another classic spot where if this folds to me, my theoretical options are to raise or to fold. But I'm going to raise because of this player in the big blind. I'm going to, my gambit's going to be that GTO Noob, who I know is a good reg, doesn't realize or doesn't react properly to the fact that I'm just like opening slightly wider with this player being in the big blind. Of course, if this player is reacting to that, I can be punished. But I think it's worth it to just open up a little bit there and always open a hand that's meant to be a mix. So this might feel really annoying. It's like if you're learning golf, for example, I had a golf lesson a couple of weeks ago, and the guy made me put a football between my arms as I was swinging the club, like a little football, not like a full-size one. And it was really fucking annoying. Like it really inhibited my swing. I think there's only one option here and it's call against the sizing. I think there's only one option here and it's check. But what that did is it forced me to keep my arms together, which was the thing that my swing kind of needed. That was the thing he wanted me to improve on. Theoretical options are going to be... What am I going to play here? I'm going to play big bets here. So big bet at high frequency, check sometimes. I don't have a deviation here. There's nothing I want to say exploitatively, so I'm going to roll it. I've rolled a bet. I'm going to bet. So big bet or check are both fine here. You could build over bet into your game as well if you want. It's just not the way I'm playing that spot. Restricting theoretical options where a one-sizing strategy is as good as a two-sizing strategy, this is generally a good idea. Sometimes you want to have multiple sizes, especially on the river, but on the flop and the turn, if you can restrict yourself to one sizing, it definitely helps. So anyway, the guy made me put this football between my arms, and my god, did it help. And this is like what I'm doing to you guys right now. I'm making you put a football between your arms as you swing the club. I'm making you be overly explicit the first few hundred times so that eventually you can take that football out, your arms are going to stay together, and you're going to be able to just do this automatically. But this is going to stop you wondering. It's going to stop the crap habits from creeping into your game. 
by me saying one option only and it's raised this hand, that might feel like really laborious, but it's not much effort once you get into the habit of it. And if you do this a few hundred times, as I say, all of your subconscious thoughts will start doing that too. Strategic options here, this is something I sometimes add to the equation, are to range bet or to split, and I'm just going to choose to range bet. Therefore, I bet small. Job done. There's no option. There's no decision. There will be on the turn if we get called here. Okay, so now, can I bet this hand again? I don't actually think so without a club. I think this is a pure check, so there's only one option. I'm going to do it. And then on the river, this is going to be a pure bluff catcher territory spot. We do block bluffs and no value with this combo. It depends on sizing, though. If villain picks a sizing that I think could be a jack or a bluff or a better hand, I probably have to call. And if villain picks a bigger bet than like this, then I'm probably just going to fold. So theoretical options here, I think is only fold. And I think that's because we don't have a club blocker to get in the way of flushes. We don't block any relevant ASEX or boats at all. Really, there's no boats containing a jack here. Ace jack raises flop, Jax isn't here. And we do block a load of bluffs with the queen, like queen 10, king, queen, etc. So I think this is just a pure fold. I'm just, I'm asking myself, is this a mix in GTO? Like, are, are two options okay? Because if two options are okay, I'm going to go to the exploitative realm. If only one is okay, I'll still just double check in the exploitative realm to see if I want to like reject it for some reason. But what people do way too much is just go off like freewheeling and think that their thought process is good enough to just solve the spot as if they're a solver. And they'll be like, I'm going to call because of this blocker. And they're looking at like a 20th of the puzzle and it's nonsense and it's garbage. Let's do this training wheels thing. Next time you play a session, drop down the tables, play half the tables you normally play and lay out the theoretical options and do this and let me know how it goes in the comments section to this video. Let me know if it's helping. The aims of this session are to stop you wondering. They're to get you using theory in the correct way where you reference all the hard work the solver has already done and if you don't have a clue what theory would say, do the carrot poker school. It will teach you how to figure that out on your own. I have not memorized a bazillion spots. I just know how game theory works. I've become accustomed to it by making a course on it that took me like a year to make. It's made me pretty good at the baseline. You do the same thing. You're going to be able to figure out the baseline and then go from there. It's not memorization, guys. Pocket fours, I believe, is... I'm going to roll in a bit of call here, actually, because I have this player in the big blind. I'd normally just play three bet fold from the cutoff. I'm going to play a little bit of three bet. Some call and some fold, and I roll the fold that time. So again, I'm just kind of doing the same thing there. Added a different option to the toolkit that I wouldn't normally play, which is just calling sometimes when I have a, a recreational in the big blind. I wouldn't play that option with a reg in the big blind. Cut off button. Queen's obviously only one theoretical option here, regardless of what happens against... Well, if under the gun opens, we can probably call actually at a low frequency. Yeah, just doing that protocol again here. If we get 3-bet by big blind, we've seen this spot already. This is a mix between 4-betting and calling. Play big bets on this flop, there's no way top set can check. Yes, you block the calling range, but you also unblock large parts of it as well, and it's just too urgent to build the pot. You don't gain anything by checking back here. Betting is higher even than checking, therefore we bet. This is an overbet only spot. Actually, with the queen, I think this particular combo actually just goes for big bet, but this is a really weird thing to balance. But I do think the overbet with particularly top set loses a little bit of EV here, so I'm just going to big bet. If my opponent knew that I only do this with top set, they probably would fold the turn. Because, like, most of my bets here are overbets, but you do need, like, a little bit of big bet for specifically hands like queens, I think. Although that might be different on double flush draw. But yeah, I'm playing a really, really face-up strategy there where my value region is mostly queens for that sizing. Probably, in reality. I think that's one of those weird caveats of GTO where the overbet option just isn't available to my hand based on its turn blockers. You could double check that for me. I might be wrong. Double flush draw might make it viable to overbet again, but I think it's probably playing as pure big bet or a mix of overbet and big bet. Okay, we'll play a few more hands here, another orbit or two, and then we are going to wrap this up. This video was never meant to be like, look at these amazing spots that happen, because when you jump into a pool with one table and rant, it functions more like a stream, but I wanted this to be more of a lecture, more of a talk on protocol using the tables, the example. So you let me know what you think about this format video. And if you like it, I may do more one table, Pete rants while playing one table kind of videos. I think that could be some cool content, you know, give me a topic to think about. I'll rant about it. I'll play one table. Some spots will come up. We'll, chips will go flying left, right and center at some point in the video, but it won't be like fast and furious, like two tabling, three tabling, four tabling sessions are. Most of you told me you didn't really like four tabling anyway, so. Okay, options are to fold or raise. I'm going to roll, I'm going to fold. And options here are going to be to raise, that's it. Feels so, like, robotic, like, so nerdy, doesn't it? But it's such a good habit. Theoretical options against this stack size is, well, it's just call anyway. 
Do I want to deviate to fold here? I don't think I'm quite ready to deviate to fold. I think I'm just going to play the normal one option that exists. On the flop, it's going to be sizing dependent. I think there'll be some raise against this sizing, so theoretical options are to raise or to call. I'm going to roll a little bit of raise. I did roll it this time. Don't mind calling here. Don't mind raising here. If I do raise, it's going to be pretty small. Make some cheap bluffs like this as well. Gain some useful fold equity. Villain folds like an ace. It's not terrible. They fold a gutter. It's great. Obviously, we do stop them bluffing a bit, but there's a load of turn cards that just aren't amazing for our hand. So raise is going to be on the cards there, I think. A low frequency call is also okay, but against quarter pot, the raise frequency is going to ramp up. Okay, two options on the table. Got a three bet this time, but I could also call. I'm going to play more three bet than call in this spot, typically. If I was big blind here, I'd go 12. I'm just going to go 10 in the small. And let's do one more hand before we wrap this one. You could speak out loud while you're doing this. You could record yourself and send it to peers. You could get it reviewed by a coach. But like doing this is super cool. Forces you to apply the theory. It forces you to check in with the theory first before you go anywhere else. Raise or call, both fine. Got a call this time. So I'm just kind of speeding that up a little bit. Shorthand there instead of being like, the theoretical options are. I'm just going raise or call. Call this time. Call only. I think there's only one theoretical option against the sizing in position. It's just to call. So that's what I'm going to do. Probably don't want to do it instantly, or you tip your opponent off that you never have a mix of raise. Turn is going to be weird against the sizing. I mean, we do have a bluff catcher here. We are blocking quite a lot of bluffs. Our, our out is okay. I have no idea against the sizing. Clearly, raise is not on the table here. I think we need a much nuttier holding, like not, not potential holding. Most ATX is going to fold. I don't know with the ace whether that's going to swing it to being a call or not. I think I'm still going to fold, and the reason is that I think it's either a mix of call and fold or a pure fold. I think it's somewhere between there. I could be wrong. Like maybe the nut straight out is is enough for me just to peel that as a bluff catcher. But my thought is that the eight is a really vulnerable card that's just like not very robust against villains bluffing a range at all. So what we get in nut straight draw there, I think we give back from the fact that the hand is super vulnerable even against the bluffing range. That could also be an under bluff spot. So folding seems reasonable. Okay, playing big bets here. I think I can big bet this hand. I can also check going to go ahead and big bet this time and go either way against our good old friend poker body 69 this player has been in the pool many times and we've been playing i think with ace jack the only theoretical option here is to check with hearts especially this is the bad suit here and the hand is a bit far up to be bluffing as well and there's a ton of bluffs here that we can run into this is probably like a chop a lot of the time or i think villain probably has fives most likely villain has fives here but because we're chopping sometimes against a random fish we're going to call of course 6-8, yeah, similar thing. They're making calls pre that are not good, but don't think we can quite fold that one. All right, guys, we're going to tick this out next big blind box. Talking about theoretical options against one big blind, by the way, maybe we don't go there. Maybe that's one of the rare exceptions where we don't have to lay out the theory first, where we can just jump straight to like what we think is going on, and that is that we are usually losing, but hey. Okay, strategic option here is small bet. You can range bet or you can split. Probably just going to range bet, to be honest, if checked to here. Obviously, my hand's a pure bet anyway. But thinking strategically means thinking about your range first before you come to your hand. It doesn't mean not thinking about your hand. People get that wrong. They think that when they learn how to think about ranges, they can stop at the fact that their range is doing well and just bet some random hand. That's not how it works. You've got to think about your hand as well. All right, guys. That is the end of the session. I think you guys know what to do. You've seen me do this drill. Here's a mission for you. Come back here, report back to the comment section. Let me know if you've completed your mission. Your mission is to play for half an hour only, to play half the tables that you normally play, to speak out loud if necessary, record yourself whatever you want to do, lay out your theoretical options and then choose between them exploitatively or mix with an RNG between them if you can't choose exploitatively. That's your goal. Go away, do it, come back here, let me know how you got on. Looking forward to hearing lots of you reporting back. And being like, that was really cool, Pete. It really organized my thoughts and it really settled me and just put me on the right kind of logical path. That's what I'm hoping is going to happen. Let me know what you think about the format. And by the way, guys, Grady, Carrot Poker School is coming very soon. That's our extremely valuable mass data course where we've taken millions upon millions of hands and showed you exactly how the pool is playing all the common spots in the game. This is kind of the definitive exploitative thing that you will ever need. See you here for another video very soon. Good luck at the tables. Bye for now.